Welcome and thank you for joining us for this panel, which will discuss BRICS in expansion. My name is Nadine Hani. I present the business news on Al Arabiya News Network, broadcasting out of Dubai and Riyadh. And it is my pleasure to be here with you today, once again in Davos, to moderate this panel. This panel is being televised and broadcasted on Al Arabiya Business as we speak. As we all know, the acronym BRIC was first coined by the famous Goldman Sachs economist Jim O'Neill in 2001, predicting that the economic weight of these countries could eclipse the world's biggest economies in the decade that followed. In 2010, South Africa joined the group and it became BRICS. No additions were made after that until last year, when six countries were invited to join. Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, Iran, Egypt, the UAE, and Argentina, which recently announced formally that it will not join the group. BRICS was never a formal organization or alliance with a legally binding contract, but rather a group of countries that, with its possible expansion now, will contain 46% of the world's population and 25% of global exports. Its GDP will then exceed that of the G7. The bloc calls for the uni united stand of emerging and developing countries, yet there is a large divergence between its member countries. So can it forge consensus among its diverse members, and to what extent can it contribute to the reshaping of the global geopolitical and economic landscape? These are some of the questions that we will try to answer over the next 45 minutes. Before we start our convers conversation, I would like to note that we have uh, some speakers who will not speak in English, so please, there is simultaneous translation. You can use your translation kits on the seats if you'd like to listen uh, in your own language or in English. Also, if you would like to share with us, also for our online audiences, uh, if you would like to share about us on social media, please use the hashtag WEF24. And for the audience in the room, welcome. And I will give you the chance to address your questions to our speakers a little bit later on. So please start preparing <coughs> your questions. So please join me our esteemed with, in welcoming our esteemed speakers. We have uh, here next to me His Excellency Mr. Abdullah bin Tawq al-Marri, Minister of Economy of the United Arab Emirates. Next to him is Her Excellency Madam Smriti Irani, Minister of Women and Child Development of India. We have with us also His Excellency Mr. Enoch Godongwana, Minister of Finance of South Africa, and Mr. Jifan Gao, Chairman and CEO of Trina Solar from the People's Republic of China. Thank you so much, speakers, for taking the time to be here with us today. Your Excellency Mr. Al-Marri, let me start with you. The UAE has joined BRICS. What were the reasons for joining BRICS and what economic or other value could that bring to the UAE? First of all, Andy, thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here on stage with you all, really talking about the BRICS, talking about engagement. It's great to be here in Davos, beginning of the year 2024, really putting, setting aside the policies and agendas for the coming year. I think joining the BRICS, first of all, the invitation, we are very committed to really join. It's a commitment not just on the level of the UAE, but the world. His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the president of the UAE, has said by joining the BRICS on the X platform, he said, we're not just committed to the BRICS, we're committed to humanity and the people of the world. So joining it is as well on the last le levels of work that we'll be doing on the leadership level. We've been the guest country for G20 in India, and the guest country in the G20 in Indonesia. We're a guest country in G20 as well in, uh, in, 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 in uh, Brazil. And we are continuing as well our work on the levels of international policies to really bring together the world in engagement. We are living a fragmented world. Last year, we spoke about you know, entering a fragmented world. Today, we are in a fragmented world. Now, we need to go to, to these engagements and aspects where we really need to discuss, create, creating as well discussions. And the South-South is the most important aspect for us. We are the UAE in the middle of the world. A lot of businesses, a lot of trade, and a lot of ways that comes through the UAE and as well down to the south. And I think looking at the BRICS and being part of it will bring a lot of value from not a geopolitical level, but from a geoeconomic level. And I think that's something where the UAE can be, play a role and a pivotal role in the engagement on the global level when it comes to BRICS. Uh, this engagement as well brings a lot of as well investments. The UAE has well committed the uh, 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 sum of money into the BRICS bank. Development Bank, and we're looking as well to within the BRICS Development Bank to work together as well on investment and infrastructure and aspects as well into the BRICS nations. We're looking forward to build infrastructure. We're looking forward to bring, build bridges between our nations and friends and colleagues uh, uh, around the BRICS uh, uh, institution and looking forward as well engaging on uh, ge uh, in economic policies as well globally. 
Your Excellency, Mr. Godongwana, South Africa joined BRICS in 2010. As I had mentioned, there had been no additions until last year, the summit in Johannesburg, when uh, the invitations were sent to six countries to join BRICS. Why has that happened now? Uh, the issue of uh, BRICS expansion is not something that emerged during last year. It has been an ongoing debate. Uh, for instance, within the new development bank, an extension was already read before the political extension. A number of countries have joined the new development bank. So there has been a discussion of expansion both at the bank level and at the political level. To, uh, the realist focus is really, as my colleague has said, the key issue is how do we mobilize savings of the South in order to ensure that we can have a better development agenda for the South. That's, that's a critical part of it. But of course, there's also a common agenda which we share. As you can see, most of these countries are not necessarily the same on a number of areas. But there's common minimum program where we would agree upon a common development agenda, a common view that there needs to be a reform of the international, of the multinational institutions. You say that this has been in the works for quite some time, but when we look at the original members of BRICS, the five countries, who were the promo pro proponents or were wanting to expand that alliance? I think there's, I can't put that there's a proponent. There's general, general agreement. What would have delayed it is the discussion about the criteria, what criteria we're going to use in the selection process. So that is taken. Uh, a bit of it or some time. Of course, we may not have been on the same page ideological on a number. How we see, we will look at each country with the same ideological lens. Those things have had an impact. And you say that there were some metrics taken into consideration for who to join. What were those metrics? Look, um, at the moment, that was done by my uh, uh, colleagues or the, at the political level. My side is always the easiest uh, track which is the finance track. We, uh, when we're looking at the NDB, we're looking at the, uh, really at the strength of, the, of each country, its governance, financial governance, and so on. That's largely for, from our side, where there is likely to impact on the rating of the banks. So we, uh, kind of technical on our side, is mostly our colleagues from foreign affairs grapple with those questions. Your Excellency, Madam Irani, how does India perceive the expansion of BRICS? I think in the shadow of what the minister just said, uh, one has to say that this was the elegance that is expected of BRICS, that there is no race to claim stake at who succeeded in expanding BRICS speaks volumes about the fact that BRICS is a platform of consensus, takes into consideration not only the financial prowess of the region, but also the aspirations of people who want to leverage it for the global good. So insofar as India is concerned, and as the Gender Minister of India, I'm extremely proud that our colleagues in South Africa gave prominence to gender and inclusion in not only the financial segment, but also looking from a lens of social justice, that this combine of nationalities could bring forth that you can succeed financially and at the same time ascertain methodologies that will ensure that resources that are needed for a platform of all communities can be exercised. But if I were to ask you, uh, Your Excellency, to remove your cap as a Minister for Gender and put your cap as a representative of India on the panel, uh, how does, was India a proponent of the expansion of BRICS? How like does I said, I shall follow in the elegance of my colleagues <laughs> and, uh, and say, and I think that it makes for healthy politics, domestically and internationally. When you're not in the race for claiming um, success individually, but you understand the potential as a unit that you can leverage for not only the good or the benefit of the people of your region, but also internationalize that benefit. I am extremely grateful that you asked me to remove my gender hat, thereby signaling that I speak for gender across the world. But as an Indian also, we have potentially proven the point of uh, growth, 
reform and at the same time ensuring social justice and delivering both social justice, reform, resurgence of segments of economy that were otherwise not considered um, and at the same time deliver on democracy. If uh, one has to look at the Indian position, what do we have to offer? Uh, the celebration at BRICS about our missions uh, courtesy ISRO when we landed on the dark side of the moon was not a celebration limited to India alone. The cooperation in space technology is something that has been written about. In India, we send a mission to Mars at a budget less than it takes to produce a Tom Cruise movie. The fact, <laughs> the fact that we have 265 million Indian children in K-12, 41 million Indian youngsters in higher education, the fact that we have internationalized our learning potentials, we have 12 billion plus QR codes only on learning, the fact that we have the largest contingent of IT professionals deployed internationally, and in this year alone in India, 2024, the need for data science and IT professionals in only India is one million. The fact that we are the largest producers in the world for rice, wheat, milk, pulses, fruits, brick is the place to be, I think, in an expanded version when you want to ensure that we become one of the bridges between the global north and the global south. Mr. Gao, you, are, uh, you cannot speak on behalf of the government, but you, rep you are a representative of the private sector in China. So let me ask you, how does the private sector in China perceive the expansion of BRICS? Um, can okay. I repeat the question or did the translation get it? Okay. Okay, okay, okay. This is the. Well, the expansion of BRICS has led to its covering 3.5 billion people and 29% of world GDP. And globalization is a topic for everyone. And when we talk about climate change and the energy transition, they are equally global. In 2023, solar new capacity added in all the BRICS countries was 55% of the world. China was the leader. We had 40% of the world's installed capacity last year. And India is also a leader. It's in the top three countries in terms of installed capacity for solar. In the Latin America, uh, uh, Brazil accounts for 65%. And South Africa accounts for 70% of installed capacity in Africa. The UAE, Sa Saudi Arabia, and other Middle Eastern states have also announced ambitious plans for renewable energy development. Developing renewables is not just about, uh, about climate change, but also achieving green development. And when we look at the BRICS countries, if we talk about energy technology as well as the energy transition, they are world leaders. So. This is not just about sharing between the BRICS countries in terms of green development. It's also about making our contribution to the world, spreading green technology in order to better stimulate the green transition. Now, when I talk about green development, it's not just about climate change. It's also about reducing poverty. And I mean that when I say it. In the south, we have lots of land and lots of sunlight. If you can use new energy technologies and set up solar cells, it's much easier to establish industries, factories in places where I otherwise couldn't. And that allows developing countries to develop faster and better. And so cooperation between BRICS countries is good for renewable energy, but also for the development of other industries. So that's a contribution to the world economy, as well as to the struggle against climate change. Thank you, Mr. Gao. Um, I know that you are all keen to uh, discuss the economic benefits of BRICS expansion, and I will ask you about that, because I think this is a very important 
point to discuss. However, we need to also put uh, or answer questions about the political context of what is happening. So just let me ask you one more question on, on that level before we go into the economics. Uh, Your Excellency, Mr. al when the UAE decided to join, it joined at a time where there is extreme polarization in the world. It joined at a time where there is the Ukraine-Russia war and Russia is under sanctions, and there is the trade war between the United States and China, and also there are some sanctions on technology, uh, technological sectors and others in China. So how does the UAE perceive the political dimension of becoming a member of BRICS? All right, uh, thank you, Nadine, for the question. I think, the, first of all, let's uh, uh, clear things up. I think uh, we're not living in a Cold War environment at the moment. And joining the BRICS is not from a political stance, it's from an economic stance. The UAE joining it, yes, pluralization has happening. It has happening unprecedented since 1980s. But the joining of the BRICS is more of the kind of the South-South agenda putting in place, the kind of thinking of engaging as well traders, trade, supplies, demand. And when we look at it today, the UAE or the economy in the world, we're looking from a supply and demand chart. Demand is high, supply is low. And I think that the, the, that's what the reason of the inflation increase. I've been reading the news of the Financial Times this morning, uh, Christine Lagarde saying there's no cuts, I think, till the end of summer. And I think there's inflation is, uh, the, uh, is back up in the UK the tenth, after 10 months of low inflation. So there is a lot of inflation demanding a lot of people and products and services are happening. But without the South-South agenda, looking from an economic perspective, really putting together uh, an agenda of trade, an agenda of economy, towards as well our colleagues are looking at from a perspective of really uh, giving supply to markets in need of that kind of aspect is something which is an important, an important pillar. From that, I'll probably say, uh, uh, I think the discussion of joining the BRICS or not joining the BRICS, BRICS is, a, is an institution, it's, a, it's an organization that really puts as well a different agenda on track. The UAE is engaging on all tracks to it. Now, the UAE will always engage the West, we have as well a huge engagement politically uh, with the UN Security Council, with the other as well organization, the OECD. We do a lot of engagement with the G20, like I said. And I think the important aspect of it as well, that this engagement in a fragmented world that we're living in is creating new, new ways of actually dealing, new ways of actually putting things to really give the supply side of what was needed to reduce inflation on, on, on people and on economies to really grow the economies moving forward. Now that's the, that's, that's the kind of look for for the UAE on this perspective. Madam Irani, you, you come from a country that has very good relationship with the West. And uh, the, you, you are one of the original members of BRICS. Um, how does India balance between the two differing, the differing agendas of uh, the other members of BRICS? If the agenda is growth, if the agenda is inclusion, if the agenda is servicing global aspirations, then India is well positioned to be a bridge, uh, no matter what the conversation or what the geography. But today the agenda to is forward, to a certain extent also political. I think that if you take forward from what the gentleman has just said and just look at it fiscally, mm -hmm. today in India we've had three years of growth of 7% plus, and this is in the shadow of the pandemic. In India now, our governor of the RBI, which is our central bank, the projections for the next financial year is a 7% growth as well. IMF has said that India will contribute 16% to the global growth. We have also managed in the past nine years to bring 240 million Indians out of multi-dimensional poverty. Our inflation rates today are in fact lower than that they were a decade ago. So when it comes to practices uh, where we share not only the agenda of fiscal discipline, we can also say that irrespective of the pandemic and how we service the needs of our people in the pandemic, we also looked at upon it as an opportunity to bring about reform for businesses, not only in India, but for investors worldwide. Mm. Today, our stock exchange has overtaken some very established old giants. But at the same time, we have used this time to take away 63,000 compliances that were hindering businesses in India and our foreign partners, and we have done away with over a thousand obsolete laws. So India has made a case not only for fiscal prudency, fiscal growth, but also made a case for reform, mm. 
And at the same time, we have used our digital infrastructure today on the promenade, the buzzword is technology. As the chair for the Global Alliance on AI, we are now promoting responsible behavior with regards to AI, insisting on a convergence or a consensus on watermarking AI products so that nations at large have a very balanced approach towards emerging technologies. But at the same time, we have digitally delivered close to 400 million loans for businesses without collateral. We service 800 million people in our country with free food for the past two years. And we've delivered 200 billion vaccine doses fidgetily. So there are, there are many such examples of inclusion of digital prowess of fiscal prudency and reform that India brings to the table irrespective of which region we are conversing with. So instead of looking at an expanded BRICS in collision with the West, I think we can use these opportunities and learn from each other because irrespective of how fractured or fragmented the world seems today, I proudly say as an Indian that we can help become the democratic glue that brings everybody together. Uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Godongwana, one of the long-standing calls of BRICS was a reform of the international decision-making bodies uh, to reflect more the weight of the developing countries. To what extent have, has BRICS been successful in that area? What progress has been made? Uh, let, let me take an example of the IMF. Uh, Africa had three chairs. Um, which means we had two representatives on the board. Uh, as we speak in, in October, we'll be finalizing the third chair for Africa. South Africa, uh, Africa and sub saharan Africa will be represented by having three members of the board. That in itself is not a product of generosity. It's in a product of fight by people of the South and Africa themselves, uh, supported by uh, our our colleagues in, 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 in the developing world. So that, for, for me, is a practical example of some of the of struggles of the reform. There will be uh, difficult ones, like reforming the Security Council and those other ones. Those uh, are going to take a while. But within the World Bank, much di discussion and debate about uh, the, the, the World Bank's focus uh, moving forward. You can see the World Bank is no longer the World Bank of the 80s, whose focus has been in structural adjustment only. The World Bank has shifted completely. Uh, we have agreed now on a, a new roadmap. So those discussions are also a, a, a process of, 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 of this battle for the reform of these institutions. Uh, what about the, the alternative, the new development bank that has been set up by BRICS? The new development which has been set up by BRICS is, is placed on a different vision and a different approach on, on, on dealing with the developing world. And, and, and for that reason, is an attempt also to set a, a template as part of as with the battle we're doing in the bigger ones, was is part of setting a template that things could be done differently. Uh, let me just um, ask you one more thing about uh, BRICS future. Do you think that it might turn into a more institution, uh, institutional uh, block rather than just a group of countries coming together? I, I would imagine over time, I would imagine over time one of the key things we need to do is to say having a great now being this bigger block than we were in the past, occupying a better sp a space in the global economic setting. Uh, what should be our role? Should we be a loose uh, organization as we are, or should we become a more of a, uh, a coherent group, uh, develop a common message, uh, work together? And I think that, to me, is the logic of what is likely to come out of this discussion. Uh, Mr. Gao, you are a global company that is, uh, has businesses all over the world, and definitely the business environment has become more challenging with the sanctions that we've been talking about, with the fragmentation that we see all around the world, um, the different blocks now, the expansion of BRICS. How do you navigate those challenges? Well, it is true that uh, 
uh, we have uh, business uh, business activities in more than 170 uh, countries, and uh, we are a global company. And of course, we. Uh, feel uh, firsthand all these challenges that the world is facing. But uh, of course, we share uh, this planet, and our mission uh, is to serve the planet. And uh, we uh, want to bring uh, well-being uh, to the population of the world. To achieve this vision, to achieve this objective, we focus on the following. First, innovation. Through technological innovation, uh, we have reduced uh, the costs of the production, and now it's the one-tenth of a few years ago. Not only uh, developed countries, but also developing countries can use uh, solar uh, panels and uh, PV technologies uh, to uh, boost their economic development. Uh, secondly, we focus on cooperation. Over the last three years, uh, uh, our company's um, uh, business uh, increased, uh, sales increased uh, three times. And uh, why, uh, how did we uh, do that? That is because we have uh, uh, deepened our cooperation uh, with our global partners in terms of uh, products, services, and uh, we have this. Uh, a very good uh, cooperation uh, through dialogue. And uh, of course, uh, we pursue uh, the common interests of everyone, and we focus on our customers. And based on that, we develop our products and services. That's why our customers, our clients, really appreciate us. And of course, today we face uh, some obstacles and barriers in trade. But uh, we do hope uh, that uh, uh, in uh, terms of uh, uh, technological development and uh, uh, in other aspects, we hope there will be a, a free uh, flow of trade so that uh, the renewable energy can have great development in the future. Your Excellency, Mr. Madi, I promised to talk about the economy, so let's talk about it. What kind of opportunities and economic impact do you think uh, does an expanded BRICS provide uh, and opportunities for South-South cooperation? I think. Uh, Going back to the supply and demand charts, so that's what I always see now every every week where we are, the way and inflation and how do we really, you know, that's the kind of nightmare for any minister of economy globally. I think the, um, the economic aspects of it is more trade flows, more connecting trade ports, more connecting policies on the level of creating products towards the markets of, of need, especially in the developing nations. And I think that's something which will bring to the table of the BRICS in, 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 in discussions mm. on, on economic and trade policies. That's th something which we are uh, looking for. And I think more trade and more aspects to really lower down the aspects of uh, uh, challenges we're facing the interest rates and really looking at an environment in the world that differs. Now, the world is going to live in, in the next uh, decade is going to be a high interest rate and high inflation. That's for sure. But what the BRICS is going to bring in as well is a counter to that where we can supply more to the demand and increase that more, more products can be created in the BRICS nation and actually d d deliver on it to, on the time and need. Now, the levels of way we look at it as well is different. In the past, the, uh, the, uh, the, the factory might get a call that says, how much uh, I need such quantity by such certain date. Today is I need certain quantity by certain date with carbon neutrality <coughs> as, as part of it. So the carbon transition as well and the, and the, and the, and the climate, ch climate change transition is something that the BRICS as well is something we're looking for to, to really engage. Hosting the COP28 back in November, bringing the global, global, uh, global nations together to really have a declaration on the world to really focus on neutrality of carbon, uh, carbon neutrality and emissions to reduce it. And the BRICS can really focus on as well uh, on, the, on that, lowering the, the carbon, carbon uh, aspects and really bring trade to it. Let's take a few questions from the audience. If you have a question, please, can you give me a sign and we will pass on a microphone. So we have questions uh, here. Can we pass on microphones, please? First there. Thank you. Please uh, always tell yeah. us your name and the question, who yeah. is it addressed uh, Hi, to? my name is Sanjeev Gupta. I'm a board member at Africa Finance Corporation, which is an African multilateral. Uh, the question actually, uh, funnily enough, is towards you. Honey, rather than the speakers. Me. And okay. that is because uh, I come from a world where I believe that rather than unipolarity or bipolarity, multipolarity is what we are looking for. So why are you so concerned 
about the political ideology of BRICS. Because I am a news person, and these are the headlines every day. <laughs> no, the, the reason I was asking is because in my own mind, sorry, Minister, I was... Can you, deny, can you deny that the expansion of BRICS happens at a time where the members of the BRICS internally have different, different opinions towards the Honey, West, towards the... No, no, I think yeah, but this is a symbol of Indian men asking tough questions. No, well, well that was very gender insensitive, Madam Minister. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm but, trying to save a few people <laughs> no, no, talking no, no, on the you. panel. <laughs> no, no, but the point but I'm making, ma'am, if I may, if I may make the point. I will elegantly transfer the question. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, but if I may make I'll the point, the and at the I cost of sounding controversial, I'll but the question needs to be asked, that we don't ask the IMF and World Bank what the political ideology is. We say it's an economic ideology that is driving it. So, so should we look at this new institution? Because from the world I come from, which is Africa, where we're always looking for investors to come in, I welcome BRICS because it gives us choices. And that's what I want the world to appreciate. Thank you. Excellent. Sorry, Mr. Excellent. Minister, it's Sorry. bad manners to interrupt you, <laughs> I know. Uh, if you allow me, he has a very great hat. And every time I see him in Davos, he brings a new hat. <laughs> and Sanjeev. <laughs> and I think that's something which I would like to add, if you allow me, uh, on the aspect of what I said, the, the, the platform we're sitting here, and BRICS is not a, it's not, it's not a, a, a political kind of stance and neither we are in a Cold War environment to join and not to join. This is something we need to clear it out on this stage here and right now. And this is the aspect. It is, it is opportunities, it is trade, it is economic drivers. It is those that what actually allows us to really look at the BRICS with the global south-south agenda of trade and economy. And I'm probably that's, that's something I wanted to say, and I said it, and I think it's important that you brought it back in again. And this is the message we want to send to the world, that the BRICS is not a political agenda. It is an economic agenda, and it is not a Cold War environment we're living in. It is joining for the trade, trade, trade goods and, and trade services. Oh, we have a question here. Please, can we pass on again the microphone? If you have a question, please give me a sign so that I can give you the opportunity. Okay. Thank you. My name is uh, Awolowo from Nigeria. And my question is to my brother, the... Uh, South African uh, Minister of Finance. Uh, well, we understand what BRICS is trying to do, uh, but we also have the African Continental Free Trade Agreement in force now. And uh, basically, many people have uh, talked about some skepticism about, about it. And when you also look at the EU with Brexit, now will South Africa, uh, uh, champion the AFCTA uh, in BRICS. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think part of the difficulty, my, my brother, you should understand, our economies have always, which particularly South Africa, has been heavily dependent on the West. So a delinking for us is quite critical. In other words, changing the trading patterns. Part of that is is is. By the way, it's an important development for our economy this year, precisely because two of these developments are taking place this year. One is the, is the, is the BRICS expansion. Secondly, is African Free Trade Continent uh, agree, Trade Agreement. These are taking place, all, all of them, this month. Uh, for us, we see that as an important development for South Africa. In fact, on the 31st of this month, the president is launching from a South African perspective uh, uh, that free trade agreement in, in South Africa. So it's an important point, it's an important milestone. Our trade patterns have changed greatly with Africa. Africa now has become our second, uh, our second trading partner as South Africa. That shift uh, in, in, in trade is so important for us because it reduces that dependence. Uh, uh, I'm sorry that we, uh, there were still questions, but our time is up very quickly. Okay, very, very quick question and quick answer, please. Yes, my name is Sonja Alvarez from German magazine Wirtschaftswoche. I would like to know where do you see Russia's role within BRICS? And I would like to know, do you see China dominating BRICS? Thank who you. is the question addressed to? To uh, well, anyone who is willing to answer. We need a volunteer. No, no. <laughs> There's no one dominating each other in, in BRICS. The institution is, the tra is built on the basis that there's mutual respect, there's consensus in decision making, and therefore there can be a no dominance. It's unlike the Bretton Woods institution. They were carved up in 1944. 
the World Bank belongs to the Americans, the IMF belongs to Europe, that is not questionable, and therefore they've got to be dominant in those institutions. In I'm, the BRICS is consensus. I'm sorry uh, that we don't have... Apologies that we don't have any more time for questions from the audience, but I want to wrap it up on a positive note. So please give us, in a nutshell, very briefly, each of you, what you expect on a, on a positive note on economic co cooperation from this expansion. Uh, the, uh, Your Excellency. Like I said, I think the, uh, the expansion is like putting a global South-South trade, trade agenda, economic agenda. That's something which is the aspect that should be the domination. Yes, there is. Uh, there's a lot of challenges within the BRICS members. There's a lot of challenges internally as well, with is the uh, inflation, which is uh, whatever the uh, interest rates going up and high, with developing uh, as well more infrastructure. There's a lot of challenges that goes in, and I think we come in with a, with an open open mind to to it. And I think the 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 positive note is that we're creating a global South South agenda, which has a lot of economy to it and trade, and that's something we're bringing to the table. Very briefly, uh, your I think be it the South-South or the Global South, we as an expanded BRICS need to recognize that there will be conversations that will center around our intention, given the capacities financially we bring to the table. We need to be ready for the dialogue because we have lived in a world where certain institutions have not reflected our aspirations or our civilizational or cultural heritage to understand our people, our potential better to uh, take forward the minister's, uh, uh, I think, position on financial issues till now. I think when you look at a future which is inclusive and growth oriented, and we are looking at supply chains that are globally resilient, I will only make one case on behalf of India, that when there was a shutdown of movements of goods and services, in India, a very small segment of a PPE kit was self-generated. We had no machines, no um, raw material, but in March when the pandemic hit us, from zero companies in May, we went up to 1,100 companies. By June, we were the second largest exporters in the world. And we've shown what we can do as a part of the global supply chain, not hold our supply chain hostage for geopolitical reasons, not subjugate our supply chains for any other political or economic interests. So I think we are uh, the one partner the BRICS expanded lake and count on. Very briefly, Your Excellency. Yeah, no, I'm saying part of the important thing we should take into account is that uh, not everything happened at an institutional level. What this creates is that we're, we're, we're able to deal with India on a different basis because we now both are uh, members of, two, of, of, of BRICS, same with, with, uh, uh, with China. Now we're facing a number of, of, of electricity challenges in South Africa. We're talking to both countries there, working with both countries in the resolution of the problem, not with the whole BRICS as an institution, but it does create an environment where your BRICS member now looks at you with a different eye, with a BRICS eye. So that also has been important. Bilateral cooperation can be yeah. better. It's Mr. Advanced. Gao, final comment. The the BRICS system should be seen as one paving the way for better economic cooperation, South-South cooperation, and um, it's a big uh, spur to South-South trade and economic development achieved between BRICS countries can benefit the whole world. Now, we are planning to invest 5 billion US dollars in the UAE to set up one of the world's largest production facilities for photovoltaic, which will be able to service not only the Middle East region, but also become a major part of the world's supply chain for solar. Your Excellencies, Mr. Gao, thank you very much for being here with us today. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.